بالله من شر الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لترى بمقدمه الفداء أما بعد respected scholars, elders, brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن شاء الله as a recap as we've been discussing for the last week or so it seems we've been discussing particular issues in reference to knowledge, the importance of gaining knowledge, the importance of utilizing knowledge, and the importance of application of knowledge. And we found yesterday, as we discussed one of the applications in reference to the aspect of dialogue, as we did say that we were going to finalize it in yesterday's topic, however, I've been asked to talk about uh, particular dot points that I have mentioned yesterday, which are in reference to interfaith dialogue, and if I could elaborate on that. And inshallah, I'll start inshallah tonight's topic by elaborating on that aspect, and inshallah moving on, which will be the topic in reference to Ali ibn Abi Talib in the upcoming nights, and the power and the qudra that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has entrusted in the Ahlul Bayt, and especially. Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So to start off tonight's topic, inshallah, and a recap from yesterday. When we mentioned dialogue, we mentioned particular aspects in which we looked at Ali ibn Abi Talib. We looked at the dialogue for Imam Rida, alayhi afdal salati wa salam, when he debates in his munadhara, the Christian, the Jews, and the atheists, and the replies that he came up with. Obviously, it was a very long dialogue, which I didn't mention all of it because it needs a couple of hours. However, I looked at particular examples in which the Imam used his knowledge. When he uses his knowledge, because he knows the people that he is debating, he knows what arguments they have, and obviously he knows how to reply. Now, the aspect I've been asked to talk about is what are we to learn when there's interfaith dialogue? And when I say interfaith, in the faith of Islam in different schools of thought, whether it be the Hanafi, Han Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi'i, or Hanbali, we find that these are interfaith as in they are in the cocoon which is Islam. We might have differences of even, so to say, the idea that we have of prophethood. As you know, we have the idea that the prophet is infallible. Other schools of thought, of theology, of jurisprudence say that the prophet wasn't infallible in all aspects. This can be a source of debate and dialogue. You may find that we have a different, and remember, do not quote something, inshallah, if you want to just realize exactly what I'm about to say. We may have not a different God, but it's a very important aspect. We have a different definition of our God. The school of thought of Ahlul Bayt and those from other schools of thought have a different definition of God. As you know, our God... He's infinite. When Imam, when Imam al-Rida is asked by the Christian, he says, where is your God? Show him to me. And he says, in your very question lies your own answer. He says, what do you mean? He says, God cannot be seen. If you could see God, it means you can objectify him. You can limit him to your eyesight. Therefore, he's not infinite. He says, your answer is in your own question. When someone comes to Imam al-Sadiq, he says, show me God. Imam al-Sadiq says, look at the sun. The man looks at the sun, quickly looks away. He says, what's wrong? He says, I can't bear to look at it. He says, you can't bear to look at the creation that Allah has created. You want to look at the creator? He says, there's no way you can come near the creator. You cannot see him. Because if you can see him, you can limit him. If you can limit him, he's not infinite. So there's a massive loophole in which you have to look at. And when I say we have a difference in Allah, in the context, in the idea, 
which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As you know, other schools of thought have the ahadith in which they believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wal-iyadhu billah, wal-iyadhu billah, rides a particular animal. He has a foot to them that he puts it into the hellfire, wal-iyadhu billah, and it makes the hellfire keep calm or be quiet. Objectifying. Objectifying, objectifying. In our, in our main sources, that's, that's shirk in its essence. However, do we go about when we have dialogue and debates with other schools of thought? Do we say that you are such and such, that you are kuffar or ayyadu billah? We say that. We, we can't say that. We don't go out and say that because that, there's no, that's no way in which we can have debates. There's no way we can have dialogue. Have you ever found one of our scholars of one of, a pi, one of someone that's of a pious perspective or characteristics going up to someone? which is a kafir, and saying that you're a kafir, I don't want to talk to you, I don't want to debate. What, what did our imams do? People, and they had this ideology, Imam Ali alayhi afdal salatu wasalam passes by a church, or a synagogue, I can't remember. But either way, the context is what? It was a place which was not Muslim, that they worshipped in, whether it be the synagogue, or whether it be the church. Imam Ali is riding past it. One of his companions, the people that were with him, they look at Ali ibn Abi Talib and they want to, you know, how when we are around scholars and we're around someone that's of a higher educational background, you find that you want to kind of impress them or you want to act in a certain manner. We said yesterday when there was a scholar in the mosque that pretended to pray at a longer period of time because he thought someone walked in. So the person next to Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says to Ali ibn Abi Talib, says, look at this place, it's worn down. How much has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala been, has people done kufr in this place? How much has Allah's name been lowered in this place? How much have people committed atrocities in this place? Ali ibn Abi Talib, look at the reply of Ali. He could, could have turned around like any one of us and says, yes, well, imagine what kind of things were done in this place or what knowledge was taught in that place. But look at Ali ibn Abi Talib, look at how he replies to this man. He says, why do you always look at that perspective? He says, why don't you look at this place and say to, and say to yourselves, how much was Allah worshipped? How much was Allah thanked? How much was Allah found to be talked to and asked from? How much did people want to get closeness to Allah? Don't always look at the negative aspect. You might have differences in one manner. Let's look at what we have in common. When the Quran says, hold on to the rope of Allah, he realizes to us that there is one path. Hold on to it. Don't worry about your differences. Don't make that the main source of your arguments and the main source of your problems within one another. This main source of, your, of, one, of one party going against another party. Because if we remember, brothers and sisters, if we look back 50 years ago, was there such an aspect as this particular person is from this sect or this particular person from that sect. It's a whole context of divide and conquer. Nowadays, nowadays we find ourselves, if this person doesn't believe in a particular ideology, from the same marja, you find he's denounced, he's looked down upon. The Imams teach us the ethics of dialogue. When they teach us the ethics of dialogues is to look at what's good rather than that which is bad. That's why when we have nowadays, when we have anything that comes to the surface, within our same madhab, within tashayya, leave other schools of thought, within tashayya, when we have something that we may find as being a controversial topic, you find that's the only thing that's being talked about. One of the aspects is sha'ar, for example. And this is very, very, very important. When sha'ar come and you find we're, when we're getting closer and closer to Muharram, the same four topics come to the surface. Same four topics come to the surface. A, B, C, D, we all know them. And you find people from this particular part of the world, this particular part of the world, debating these issues. If someone believes in this aspect, let them believe in it. They believe that they're getting closer towards Allah doing this particular action of sha'ar. But you find, no, other people say, no, we don't believe in the sha'ar, they shouldn't be doing it. That's a wrong approach. That's the wrong approach. If they're getting closer towards Allah in a particular aspect, who are we to say that this is wrong? As in, do we have anything from the Imam saying that this is wrong? Do we have anything that goes against the Ahlul Bayt, going against Islam? No. You believe in a particular aspect, not a problem. Don't 
don't, want, don't take your ideologies and enforce them on others. You can't force someone into religion or thinking the same manner that you think. You can't have everyone in the same wavelength. That's why there's an importance of dialogue. That's why there's an importance when we look at the religion and how our imam, imam spoke and we have to cater it on how we speak. Because someone may come to you and you might not know what their background is, what sect of Islam, if he's Muslim at all, and he wants to push your buttons. He's saying, what kind of person is he? What does, what's his thought process? I'm going to go tell people. People came towards Imam Zain al-Abideen after the massacre in Karbala. And they want to come push him, see what he says. Take down notes, spy on him, go towards Yazid. What did they ask him? He says, what do you say about Yazid? What do you think of Yazid? Yazid just killed his father. Yazid, he had three years in hukum. What did Yazid do? First year, he killed Aba Abdullah al Hussein. The image of the Prophet of Islam, Islam, he kills him. The second year he goes and he massacres and he burns the Kaaba. The Jadar caught fire, the Kaaba. People still to today say, they say, and still to till day. Look at the ignorance that we have in society. And he tried to. Desecrate the Imam's shrine, uh, desecrate the Prophet's shrine as well. So this is, this is what they think that this is, this is one of our Imams, they say. Billah. These three things that he did. People come to Imam Zain al-Abideen, they say, what do you think of Yazid? They want to cause fitna. They want to take anything from his mouth to say that, you know what, the Ahl Bayt, they, they want to cause fitna. They want to do this. Look at the reply of Imam Zain al-Abideen to give us an aspect of knowledge of how to act, how to react when someone comes and tells us, tries to see our opinion. Because we're very easy to give opinions. We're very opinionated people, of course. But is it always in a place where our opinions have to be heard and have to be explored if they may hurt the other person or may cause fitna? That's something to think about. Imam Zain al-Abidin replies by saying one thing. He could have said anything. He could have said Yazid is the person that has alcohols in his courtrooms. The person that puts gold chains on his monkeys. That he enjoys the fighting of the bears, the frogs the monkeys, and other two animals. He enjoys them fighting. That's the sport that he used to watch. He used to put the monkeys on the horses and watch them ride. One day he had a special monkey. He actually named that monkey Aba Qais. Many of us might know, many of us might not. He named the monkey Aba Qais. One of his best friends was a monkey. He made him ride a horse. How, how on earth is a, you know, a monkey supposed to ride a horse? He falls, he hits his head, he dies. He kills Sayyid Shuhada doesn't shed a tear and he plays with the mouth of Aba Abdullah on a platter. However, when the monkey dies, Yazid, monkey dies, he has a three day and three night commemoration for his monkey. Tells the people, come towards me. I want you to give me your commemoration because my monkey died. Yazid. They come to Imam Zain al-Abidin. What do you think of Yazid? He could have said all of that. What does he say? He says Yazid was a good poet. That's the only thing he says. He says Yazid was a good poet. Because he knows the intentions of the people that are asking him. They know that his words may be taken against him, may cause harm to him. That's the perfection of knowledge and where to speak and how to speak. Imam Hassan, alayhi afdal salatu was salam, which we celebrated a couple of nights ago. Imam Hassan, what do we know about the treaty that he signed? When everyone went against him, his close members that he entrusted, the main generals of his army, the close companions or so, he thought close companions, that he trusted in the battlefield, that stabbed him, literally stabbed him in the leg. What did we know? Everything was against Imam Hassan. He didn't have any followers, anyone to follow him because Muawiyah was throwing money left, right and center. He's throwing money that wasn't his. He didn't care. He just wanted people to come towards him. He wanted that chair. He's throwing money left, right, and center. Imam Hassan's so-called companions. Imam Hassan thought to himself, I don't have anyone to help me. If we continue on this, people will die and continue to die. So he said, I'll write a treaty. In this treaty, you'll find knowledge, eloquence, and you'll find what is the essence of dialogue and debate. Because by your speech, by the way you act and react, 
the way you speak can bring out the other person. And I'll give you the example of Imam Hassan. Imam Hassan, of the points that he had in the treaty, he wanted to show Muawiyah for who he is. He wanted to reveal to the people who Muawiyah is. What did he write? Number one, he says, if I sign this treaty and hand over the Khilafah, number one, he says, when you die, the Khilafah goes back to Hussein. Number one. Let's see. When he died, where did the Khilafah go? Did he go back to Imam Hussein? He went to Yazid. So that's the first point. He revealed that Muawiyah didn't follow. Second point. He says, all the Sunan of the Prophet will not be changed. You can't have the Sunnah of the second, the third, whatever that may be. Because remember, Uthman, when he was chosen, they gave the option to Ali ibn Abi Talib first. They said, Ali is the best. This is after the first Khilafah and the second Khilafah. As we know, the first Khalifa, two, two and a bit years, he ruled for. Omar ruled for, I believe, ten and a bit years. Then the third person was Uthman, which ruled for 13 years. However, before he got the hukum, it was given to Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, here, would you like it? He says, what's the essence? What's the catch to it? He says, you have to rule based on the Quran, the sunnah of the Nabi, and the sunnah of the first and second Khalifa. Ali ibn Abi Talib says, I won't take it. They say, why? He says, I will do with the Quran and the sunnah of the Nabi, because that's what Islam is. Where does it say in Islam, the second and third Khalifa, I have to follow their sunnah? Especially if it goes against the sunnah of the Prophet of Islam. So they say, you don't want it? He says, no. He says, they go to Uthman, he says, do you want it? Says, of course. The Khilafah, well, who can reject it? Give me it. Takes it. Imam, Imam Hassan tells Muawiyah, he says, don't change any of the sunnah of the Prophet. I'll give you one example of, the sun, of a sunnah of a Prophet, which was... The way he lived, or the, what he did, or what he said. Jum'ah, what, what do we all know? When is Jum'ah prayed? Salat al Jum'ah. After a khutbah, there's two rak'at. When is it prayed? What day? It's in the name. It's in Jum'ah, isn't it? On the Friday. Muawiyah goes and prays it on a Wednesday because he feels like it. As an example. One of the examples. I want to pray it on a Wednesday. I'm the Khalifa of the time. I can do whatever I want. Second point. Revealed who he is. Third point. He says the companions in the land will not be harmed. Muawiyah prosecuted whoever he wanted. Third point. Fourth point. He says the Shia, the followers of Ali ibn Abi Talib, will not be harmed. He says, not a problem. I want everyone before the end of Ramadan to go and look at how Muawiyah goes and prosecutes and kills no other but the right hand man of Ibn Talib, one of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib's generals, the top figures, which was actually Abu Bakr's son by the name of Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr. I want you to go and look at how he killed him. How he killed Muhammad ibn, ibn Abu Bakr. Go and look at it, and you'll, th and you'll think to yourself, what kind of atrocities this person was capable of. The mannerisms in which he killed this companion. The mannerisms will, will leave you speechless, honestly, if you go and look it up. Four. Five. He says, I want you to stop the cursing of my father, Ali ibn Abi Talib, on the pulpits. He says, not a problem. The cursing of Ali ibn Abi Talib with every adhan was continued up until... A Khalifa, after Imam Bakr's time, he stopped it. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, he says, I'll stop this because Ali ibn Abi Talib, he heard a story in his youth that Ali killed half of the people that died in Badr. He says, this is a great man. Why are we cursing him? That's one story he had. And he stopped the cursing of Ali ibn Talib. Muawiyah didn't. But it's to show us what? That dialogue has such an important aspect. That it can be used in a mannerism in which you can act. The way you associate with other people. Imam Ali has a beautiful statement. He says, tell me who your friends are. I'll tell you what your character is. Show me who a person's friends are. I'll tell you what kind of person he is. Because it's a reflection of who he hangs around with. The example is the blacksmith. And the person that goes with the fragrance. If you go to towards someone, even if you don't do anything. And we've mentioned this. You don't do anything. You have a person that you associate with. Don't talk with him. Don't 
do any action, rather just walk with him towards his work. He's a blacksmith. He says, the prophet says, it will be guaranteed that you will get some dirt on your clothes and it will be visible. He says, that's an effect of a bad friend. You don't know how it will affect you, how it will rub off on you, but it will. The same is the example of a person that works with fragrance. He says, if you only go with him, walk with him, talk with him. He says, you don't work with him, no, but you're just next to him. He says, that bit of, that beautiful smell will rub off on you. And that's the example of good friends. He says, number one, just being around these people is an aspect. One, that's without talking. Now look at dialogue. He says, look at the dialogue. And it gives us examples of how we can act and react to particular situations if you look into the lives of the imams. And with our speech process, we can, we can take out that which is good about someone and take out that which is negative. So let's take this into our lives, inshallah. Let's bring up this particular aspect. And inshallah, in the upcoming nights, we're going to be discussing the essence which makes our imams who they are. Not going to go into detail about the stories in which encompass how they reacted with people. No, I want to go into the detail of the manifestation of Allah's beauty. The power that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given these people. Why He has given these people this power and this qudra. And what have they done in return? And can we achieve that particular rank in which they have achieved? And that will be the discussion up until the third Laylatul Qadr, insha'Allah. We pray to Allah on this aspect that He may give us the tawfiq that will act, react, and walk like that which Imam Sahib al Asr wa Zaman wants from us. With a blessed Surah Al Mubarakat Al Fatiha, but before it, three of your loudest salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad.